On Sunday the 18th of June 2023, OceanGate's support vessel loses contact with Titan, their carbon fiber PlayStation submarine. The five-man crew, including OceanGate's CEO, are never seen again. And while the world spins on what happened, I think we're missing the bigger picture. Why was OceanGate rushing to break ground on developing inexpensive technology to reach the ocean floor and who stands to benefit the most? In 1774, John Day became the first recorded death in a submersible. Day was a carpenter, and so he used his skill set to build a wooden box and loaded it onto a ship laden with sandbags. Day invited the Navy and media to come down and watch as he submerged in his submarine, hoping to win a contract to build more when he surfaced 12 hours later. A tugboat crew pulled the boat out of the harbour at Plymouth, England. He climbed inside the box and ordered the crew to sink the ship with the box attached. As the ship sank, the box was crushed by the water pressure and he died 30 metres below the waterline. At the time, the conventional material and shape for any kind of submersible vessel was a wooden bell that operates more like today's modern dive bell rather than a submarine. On the 16th of June 2023, the Polar Prince support vessel leaves the port of St. John's in Newfoundland, Canada, heading for the site of the Titanic wreck, 370 nautical miles south southeast. There have been multiple delays due to weather, and so this will be the only expedition to the wreckage of the Titanic for the year. Ocean Gate have come a long way since their start in 2009. Richard Stockton Rush is a jet pilot and aerospace engineer. After leaving university, he works as a test flight engineer on F-15 Eagle Jets. He goes back to school to get his master's degree in business administration. From 1989, he's chair and director of remote control technologies at a company called Blue View Technologies, who manufacture advanced sonar systems for the Navy, Coast Guard, and for underwater remote operated vehicles, or ROVs. From a young age, Rush has channeled his ambition into fast jets, technology, and space exploration. Unable to realize a childhood dream of flying to Mars, Rush turns his attention to the deepest places on Earth. In 2006, he applies his years of training and experience in aerospace technology to building a mini submersible based on the blueprints from a US Navy submarine commander. The depth is limited to 30 feet and Rush wants to dive deeper. He searches out privately owned submersibles, but there are few in private hands and none immediately for sale. An idea starts to materialize and in 2009, Ocean Gate is founded by Rush and Guillermo Sonlan. Guillermo is an Argentine-American technology entrepreneur. In 1998, Guillermo starts a voice recognition software company called Milo, which he sold in 2001. He continues to invest in technology startups and teams up with Rush to start OceanGate. The philosophy of OceanGate is as disruptive as a Silicon Valley startup. Use innovative technology and materials to lower the cost of deep water ocean exploration for commercial and research purposes. Rush wants to make his mark on the world. He knows that the oceans have a huge impact on the world's population, and yet most of it is inaccessible to study. By lowering the cost of getting to the places we need to study, he believes he can contribute to science and build a business taking clients to the depths of the ocean. Wealthy clients get to go places nobody else can, researchers get to study previously inaccessible locations in the oceans, and OceanGate makes a profit. Everybody wins. Rush has studied business, and so he knows that to build a high-tech company that can scale, he needs to develop his expertise and attract the right people. And this is where I can see some incongruencies between the story OceanGate puts in the media and their path to achieve that. A business model taking wealthy clients to the seabed is the same as the travel industry. If American Airlines wants to fly passengers around the world, they buy jets from Boeing or Airbus. If a company wants to build and sell planes, they build a product from the ground up. OceanGate's first expedition is to document, scan, and retrieve artifacts from the steamship A.J. Goddard. A.J. Goddard lies in 10 meters of water in Lake Le Berge, Canada. Rush puts together a crew of citizen scientists and archaeologists. 
It's not clear if citizen scientists are paying clients, but a report on the study specifies certain people as volunteers and others are listed as members of OceanGate, while OceanGate's website lists them as citizen scientists. I get the impression this is the first instance that OceanGate starts to create a gray area, blurring the lines between paying clients and crew. The AJ Goddard wreck is a shallow dive, and so the expedition relies on scuba diving rather than submersibles. The group racks up 130 dives between them. But on scuba, even shallow dives are limited in depth and time. A scuba diver must take a supply of air in a tank, and at 10 meters, there's two times the pressure compared to standing on the beach. There are two things a scuba diver needs to understand. The first is that a diver absorbs nitrogen, which then needs to be expelled from their body when they come back up. This video is not about nitrogen. You can find out more about gas in your body in this video about the bifid dolphin accident. More important for this story is to understand the difference between pressure at the surface and underwater. The relationship between water pressure and how air is compressed as you descend is Brilliant. We can calculate precisely how air responds to water pressure. If you're interested in mathematics and how the world around us is calculated, then you might be interested in the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. More on them later. The Earth's atmosphere has pressure like a weight. Above the waterline, you have one atmosphere of pressure. As you descend underwater, the pressure increases. For every 10 meters you descend, you add one more atmosphere of pressure. That's because water is 800 times more dense than air. At 10 meters, you have two atmospheres of pressure. One atmosphere of air pressure plus another atmosphere of water pressure. Let's say you blow up a balloon at the surface and take it down to 10 meters. Because the pressure has doubled, it compresses the air in the balloon into half the volume it occupied at the surface. It holds the same amount of air in the balloon, but it's compressed to half its size. That means the air is twice as dense. Same number of air molecules, but packed closer together. Of course, a balloon is flexible and it transfers the water pressure to the air inside the balloon. When a scuba diver breathes air from a tank at 10 meters, it takes twice the amount of air to fill his lungs compared to what he was breathing at the surface. To put it another way, if you breathe from a tank at the surface for one hour, that same tank at 10 meters would only last 30 minutes. So divers are limited by the amount of air they can take with them. A dive to 20 meters is equal to three atmospheres, and so the same tank would only last 20 minutes. The deeper a diver goes, the less air time they have based on the amount of air they can carry. They also absorb nitrogen, which means they need to release that nitrogen from their body, which is where decompression time comes in. Again, the bifid dolphin accident explains that in more detail. Now, Rush wants to go deeper and stay down for longer, and he wants to use submersibles to make that happen. OceanGate buys Antipodes, a five-man submersible capable of diving to 300 meters deep and sustaining life for 72 hours. A submersible is a vessel that can operate underwater but needs the assistance of a support vessel. A submarine, on the other hand, doesn't need a support vessel. It's completely self-sufficient in that the crew can eat, sleep, and live in the vessel, and it can travel on its own from one location to another. When they buy Antipodes, it's already been tested and certified by ABS, the American Bureau of Shipping. It's tested to a pressure equivalent to 380 meters deep and rated to a dive depth of 305 meters. The test pressure is 20% more than the vessel is certified to dive. One way to test a submersible vessel is to put it inside a hydrostatic chamber like the one at the National Hyperbaric Center in Aberdeen, Scotland, which tests submersibles. The chamber is filled with water and pressurized to make sure that the submersible can withstand the forces of a deep sea dive. The engineering exists to test vessels like this, and it's available to companies to put their vessels through the verification process, even if there aren't existing standards to certify them. That's the brilliant thing about engineering. You can build, test, and verify your designs. If you want to understand more about how this works, I found this brilliant course about classical mechanics, which takes you through these pressure calculations and so much more. What I like about Brilliant is that I can find the topics I'm interested in, then work through a course at my own pace, 
and brilliant guides me step by step. And they've got some amazing courses like visualizing data. So if you have to present information to your colleagues at work, then you can learn about that data and how to visualize it, which is a very practical skill set to have. You just log in and find the particular stream you like and Brilliant will guide you from start to finish and reward you for completing each section. To try Brilliant free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash waterline stories or click on the link in the description. The first 200 subscribers will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. A submersible vessel is designed to withstand the pressure of the water. The design calculations include the shapes and the materials used in the construction. A perfectly round shape like a ball or sphere is stronger than a shape like Antipodes, which has a tubular hatch protruding from the top of the structure, which introduces a possible point of failure. And it has an elongated tubular design, which means the vessel has some straight lines, which are weaker than rounded shapes. Different materials have strength characteristics. Forged steel and titanium are commonly used in the construction of submersibles and submarines. These materials have highly predictable performance characteristics. Antipodes has had an interesting life. It's originally designed as an underwater taxi for saturation divers working on the oil rigs in the North Sea. And there's a big difference between the way Antipodes is originally designed and used as an underwater taxi compared to how it's used as a submersible for deep sea tourism. Antipodes' original design is both a dive bell and a submersible. It has two chambers with different pressures inside each chamber. One dry chamber for the pilot has one atmosphere of pressure from above the waterline, and another wet chamber to transport divers, which is pressurized to the same pressure the divers are working below the waterline. This system was only used for a short period in the mid 70s. Divers don't really need to be transferred from one underwater project to another. Although there is one famous example of a ship that sank, the cook survived for three days in an air pocket and had to be transferred to a dive bell. I'll leave a link to that video here. By now you're wondering why I'm making such a big deal of this submersible and what it has to do with Ocean Gate's Titan submersible. But it really helps to explain why a submersible is so useful and how water pressure affects air. We also need to draw a line between the decisions that bring Ocean Gate to developing their own submersible rather than ordering one for their billionaire adventure business. Saturation divers can work for weeks under pressure. Let's take the 300 meter depth that the Antipodes is certified to dive. At a depth of 300 meters, that's 31 atmospheres of pressure. The gas a saturation diver breathes is compressed 31 times compared to the surface. Because of how gas works in our bodies, these divers can't go directly to the surface without decompression. That can take days, and so they're locked at the same pressure they're working and they live under pressure for almost a month. Whether they're at the surface in the ship's habitat or down at 300 meters deep, the pressure is the same 31 atmospheres. When they go to work, they descend in the pressurized dive bell to 300 meters. Because the air pressure inside the dive bell is equal to the 31 atmospheres of water pressure, they can open the hatch of the dive bell and swim out to go do their work. They can open the hatch of the dive bell and it won't flood because it's got compressed gas inside the bell and so the pressure inside the bell is the same as the water pressure at that depth. So there's no difference in pressure. But the gas in the bell is 30 times more dense than the air we breathe at the surface. Understanding this pressure differential called delta P is key to understanding how a submersible works. When they take the dive bell back to the surface, they lock the bell and seal the high pressure gas inside the bell. If that bell opens at the surface like it did in the Bifid Dolphin accident, then that air would expand to 31 times the volume of the dive bell. At the surface, there's a difference in the pressure between inside and outside the bell, but it's the opposite for the pilot of the Antipodes or other submersibles. The pilot is locked into a pressure chamber with the one atmosphere of pressure from the surface. The pilot needs to descend with the submersible, but he doesn't need to go into the water to work. When he comes back up to the surface, he needs to be able to open the hatch and get out of the submersible as if he hasn't done a dive at all. 
while a dive bell locks in the 31 atmospheres of pressure from a depth of 300 meters, then brings that pressure to the surface, the submersible is doing the opposite and locking in one atmosphere of pressure at the surface, then diving down to 300 meters. But when it takes the surface pressure down, it has to hold back the water pressure. The submersible is not flexible like a balloon. If you take a balloon down to 300 meters, the air inside the balloon will be compressed into a space 31 times smaller than it was at the surface. If the pilot of a submersible opens his hatch at 300 meters, the air inside his chamber would immediately be compressed into a space 31 times smaller than his chamber. A scuba diver has limits on their depth because of the gas they breathe and how much gas they can take down with them. Scuba divers and saturation divers are exposed to the pressure of the water. The longer they stay down, the longer it takes to decompress on the way back up. A recreational scuba diver is limited to 40 meters so that he doesn't have to worry about decompression time. That's fine because the tanks he takes down will only allow for a short dive anyway. Saturation divers are supplied with gas from the surface that's pumped down to them, which means they're not limited by time. But a dive to 300 meters will take days to decompress. The deepest saturation divers have gone is around 600 meters, and that's incredibly dangerous because your body doesn't do very well at such depths and it can take almost a week to decompress. At 600 meters deep, the gas a diver breathes is compressed 61 times more densely than it was at the surface. The gas is so dense that it feels like you have to swallow the gas rather than breathe it. Physiologically, this is about the deepest a diver could go. And to get there, they need a large amount of training and a surface supply of breathing gas connected via an umbilical to the support ship. On 17th of June, 2023, Hamish Harding, a passenger on the Polar Prince, posts a message on his social media to say they're going to attempt to dive to the Titanic tomorrow, Sunday the 18th of June. Social media is something that Rush has built into the business. He wants to have people on board with a large following and over the years he's hosted several influencers in his submersibles. Rush wants to build a tech company and a tech company needs to attract attention. Investors and citizen scientists need to be aware and they need to be excited to go places that few people have gone. And it's fair to say that Rush likes the attention. Before OceanGate buys Antipodes, it's already been converted to be used only as a submersible with one chamber. Rush is first and foremost interested in research and so he starts taking non-paying scientists to locations for research while he's working out which direction to take the business. OceanGate documents their dive sites and partners with sponsors like National Geographic and his previous employer Blueview Technologies. Rush is starting on a path to help solve some of the questions that science has about the oceans and its resources. In 2010, OceanGate uses Antipodes to take researchers and scientists to explore Catalina Island. Over the course of two weeks, they document sites around the island and they host events with local schools to inspire and educate school children about the underwater world and the sciences used to explore them. Between 2010 and 2014, OceanGate racks up dives and expeditions with Antipodes all around the US. Their contributions to science and research include taking filmmakers to depths they couldn't easily dive, testing a 3D camera from Google to map the reefs, creating high-resolution 3D scans of sites using sonar technology, documenting the condition of aging shipwrecks, evaluating the health of ecosystems and studying invasive species of fish. And they regularly take part in community outreach programs to inspire school children to follow STEM programs in their education. Now Rush is growing restless and frustrated because there are two limitations that he wants to overcome. The surface support vessel and crew to maintain and operate a submersible are incredibly expensive. Rush knows that in order to develop their subsea capabilities, he needs money from paying clients. This was always part of the plan. Antipodes is only rated to dive to 305 meters, and many of the dive sites Rush wants to go to 
aren't accessible because of this depth limit. Not that it matters because the Passenger Vessel Safety Act of 1993 has a law that prohibits submersible tourism deeper than 45 meters. It's a law that Rush disagrees with and says it needlessly prioritizes passenger safety over commercial innovation. Under this law, he's able to take researchers and scientists as non-paying crew to deeper depths. But as soon as someone pays, he has to limit the depth. But in a way, he's not really worried about that law because it only applies to commercial activity in US waters. If OceanGate offers expeditions in international waters, those rules simply don't apply, and dive sites like the Titanic are in international waters. So the only problem he really needs to solve is depth. At 0400 on the 18th of June 2023, some 370 nautical miles into the Pacific, Titan's launch and recovery platform, Lars, is lifted from the deck of the Polar Prince by the ship's crane. It swings over the side of the ship and sets down in the water. The Titan is lifted and placed on the floating platform. Almost 30 years earlier in the mid 90s, James Cameron made the same voyage into the Pacific. The Russian Mir submersible that Cameron used to make almost 33 dives followed a tried and tested form using a metal sphere for a pressure hull. In order to reach the depths of the Titanic, a submersible must resist the 380 atmospheres of pressure diving to a depth of 3,800 meters. James Cameron climbs in, then he and the submersible pilot lock the sphere behind them. As the Mir dives, the surrounding water pressure increases, but the one atmosphere of air that's locked inside is protected by the metal sphere. When the Mir reaches the Titanic, the surrounding water pressure is 380 times greater than the one atmosphere of pressure inside the submersible. The two things that are fighting back the crushing pressure are the spherical shape and the thickness of the metal. The Mir submersible was groundbreaking for its time. Instead of welding two halves of the sphere together, which introduces a weakness to the metal, the two halves of the sphere were machined and bolted together. They also used a metal alloy with a higher proportion of cobalt, giving the pressure hull a slightly better strength to weight ratio. And this is where it starts to become quite interesting because we have to commend the innovation that Rush is bringing to the industry. If you take a large block of metal and throw it in the water, it will sink. If you take the same block of metal and press it into the shape of the hull of a ship, it will float because it displaces more water than its weight. When you create a submersible pressure hull out of thin metal, it can possibly float. This is because of its weight to buoyancy ratio. But to hold back the 380 atmospheres of water pressure at the Titanic, you need to have a thicker metal, which is heavier, even though it's only displacing the same amount of water and so it will sink. Below 2000 meters is where the weight to buoyancy ratio of metal is no longer viable. There are two ways to manage this issue of buoyancy. You can either add material that is buoyant in order to counteract the weight of the thicker metal, or you can make a lighter pressure hull, provided it's just as strong. From 2013 to 2015, OceanGate starts to develop Cyclops 1. Rush makes use of facilities at the University of Washington and publicizes his relationships with NASA and Boeing. All three organizations have now distanced themselves from these claims. I expect over the years to come, lawyers will unpick the details of those relationships. In my mind, they could range from purchasing materials to shaking hands with someone who once worked there. In developing the technology for Cyclops 1, Rush introduces the idea of carbon fiber as a material for its strength to buoyancy ratio. You see, the cost of sending a submersible to such great depths comes in four categories. The cost of the pressure hull, the cost of the equipment to operate the submersible like the controls, the cost of the buoyancy to offset the weight of the pressure hull, and the cost of the support vessel. If he can reduce each of these costs by making a smaller, lighter submersible, then he can attract the customers he really wants. In a way, Rush is thinking like Elon Musk and working from a first principles approach. Rush won't go to Mars, but at least he can think like someone who's aiming in the same direction. These are innovative ideas that he's able to migrate from his background in aerospace engineering. 
In order to make it as safe as possible, Rush develops sensors to monitor the structural integrity of the carbon fiber as an early warning for possible points of failure. They test models to destruction, which helps us to see the delamination in the carbon fiber. These tests are not designed to test the strength of the materials under repetitive dives, but rather to test the sensors that monitor the sounds that the models make under stress. The sensors register real-time stress on the hull, but there are no sensors that measure deformation over time based on the factory-ready pressure hull. To my mind, if the hull has some wear and tear on one dive and the next dive adds to that wear and tear, the sensors only pick up what happens during the current dive, but not the cumulative effect of stress over time. The only way to monitor that is through non-destructive tests like x-rays and ultrasound to verify the integrity of the pressure hull. He also takes the approach of using commercial off-the-shelf equipment. And of course, Rush is not shy when it comes to media, so the world learns how he's approaching this problem. The studies capture the attention of military and energy clients who are always looking for ways to further their capabilities at a reduced cost. It seems to me that Rush runs out of patience for the testing process and wants to capitalize on the interest from potentially lucrative clients. In 2015, OceanGate buys a steel hull submersible named Lula and retrofits commercial off-the-shelf components. This is the first time that OceanGate uses a PlayStation control system and commercial off-the-shelf technology in a way that improves the pilot's experience and reduces the cost of development. The submersible is named Cyclops One. They don't fit the carbon fiber technology they've been working to develop. It can reach a depth of 500 meters with a crew of five for eight hours. While this might seem like a marginal improvement over Antipodes, Cyclops One is the test bed for future models. It has a 72 hour backup life support system. On board are oxygen cylinders, gas monitoring systems, and rebreather technology. As the crew breathe, carbon dioxide increases and oxygen decreases. Filters in a rebreather system scrub the carbon dioxide as it passes through a soda lime mixture containing sodium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide. This removes the carbon dioxide, which is captured by the soda lime mix. Compressed gas cylinders then add a small amount of pure oxygen back into the air supply to maintain a 21% oxygen level in the air. The pressure hull from Lula is already certified and Rush doesn't push it past its limits. Instead, he uses it to showcase OceanGate's ability to innovate, to further research with scientists, and to identify first principles related to the support vessel. At 0730 on the 18th of June, 2023, five men climb into the Titan pressure hull. The outer dome is bolted shut behind them. Divers then purge the buoyancy chamber on Lars, the launch and recovery platform. The platform descends around 10 meters deep. As Lars descends, Titan is able to use its thrusters to separate from Lars. Stockton Rush signals the final okay to divers through the porthole window. At 0800, Titan then starts its descent. In two hours time, they'll be at the same depth as the Titanic. On its own, Titan is neutrally buoyant, and so it has ballast weights attached to the frame in order to help it sink. Ballast is a weight that can be moved or removed. It's used to balance the weight of a watercraft and ditched to increase buoyancy. Deep Sea Challenger is a submersible commissioned by film director James Cameron at an estimated cost of $10 million. It's built in Sydney, Australia by the research and design company Acheron Projects. In 2012, Cameron used this submersible for a solo dive to Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench, the deepest point in the world's oceans at 10,935 meters. At over a thousand atmospheres, that's well over double the pressure of the Titanic. Much like the Mir submersible, Deep Sea Challenger has a spherical pressure hull made from metal. Its orientation is vertical as opposed to horizontal, which assists in rapid descents and ascents. But the rapid ascent has no effect on the crew because the one atmosphere bubble inside the pressure hull is not affected by the changing water pressure. Buoyancy is created by a material called syntactic foam. It's a custom-made foam called Isofloat, which was specifically designed for the Deep Sea Challenger project. This foam contains small hollow microspheres suspended in an epoxy resin. 
The glass microspheres provide buoyancy because they are essentially tiny sealed bubbles of air. The epoxy resin provides enough strength to withstand the extreme pressures at depths up to 11,000 meters deep. Syntactic foam was chosen because it doesn't compress under extreme pressure. The submersible's buoyancy remains consistent at all depths. This syntactic foam has an excellent weight to buoyancy ratio. It's lighter than water and strong enough to resist the crushing pressures of the deep ocean, making it ideal for deep sea exploration. The majority of the submersible's volume is taken up by this syntactic foam. But there is a big difference between the foam supporting microscopic bubbles of air and the pressure hull that has to support a large bubble of air. You couldn't use a foam like this to hold back the water pressure with an air bubble large enough to hold a person. For that, you need a pressure hull strong enough to hold back the pressure of the water. Deep Sea Challenger has metal plates clipped on at the bottom of the vessel. These weights are designed so that the vessel is negatively buoyant when they're attached, so it sinks. When they reach their dive depth, they drop some weight so that they're neutrally buoyant. They neither float nor sink. At the end of the dive, they drop more weights to be positively buoyant and they float up. Now the Deep Sea Challenger is only designed and tested to make a handful of dives and then it's retired. Around the same time that Ocean Gate is gearing up to start work on their carbon fiber hull, they have an interview with Fast Company. Rush outlines Ocean Gate's strategy. Get wealthy clients to buy tickets. Funding the development and proving the technology to oil and gas companies who spend $16 billion a year on remote operated vehicles. And when talking about using wealthy clients as a stepping stone to mining oil, gas and minerals on the ocean floor, he says, these things are going to happen one way or the other. We're not going to be involved in oil production, we're just going to be involved in inspection, repair and maintenance. And the cheaper you can make that, the more you'll do it. Perhaps he learned from Odyssey Marine that the path to fortunes is not with shipwrecks, but with mining mineral resources. Odyssey Marine started as a treasure hunter, scouring the oceans for shipwrecks. But when that business model fell apart, they turned their attention to mining the seabed. Here's a video about the $500 million treasure that changed their business model. In early 2017, OceanGate orders their first titanium hull. After taking delivery, the hull is wrapped in carbon fiber using a computer program pattern to ensure the carbon fiber strands are evenly distributed around the hull. The fibers overlap each other, but they don't intersect at varying angles. Embedded into the hull are the sensors that will measure and alert the pilot to any anomalies in the structure. In theory, this should allow the pilot enough time to ascend before the hull deforms from the pressure of the water. At the end of 2017, OceanGate glues the titanium end caps onto the carbon fiber pressure hull of their new ultra deep submergence vehicle, Titan. The submersible is assembled and in January 2018 it's handed over from engineering to operations for them to inspect and test. In late 2018, Triton submersibles launch Triton 36000-2 at a cost of around $37 million, also known as the limiting factor. It's a two-man ultra deep water submersible capable of reaching the deepest points of all the oceans. Triton Submarine specializes in the design, manufacture and operation of submersibles for researchers, explorers and super yacht owners. Limiting Factor made history as the first manned, commercially certified, full ocean depth submersible. It was used in the Five Deeps expedition, led by explorer Victor Vescovo in 2018 and 2019, making multiple dives to the deepest part of all five of the world's oceans. The pressure hull is a sphere made of titanium with 90 millimeter thick walls able to withstand the 1000 atmospheres of pressure at over 11,000 meters deep. A single 1200 centimeter viewport or acrylic window is also designed to resist the extreme pressures. First, the materials of the hull are tested for their strength and resilience under high pressure. Small samples of the material are put in a hydraulic press to determine their breaking point. During and after the fabrication process, non-destructive testing methods like ultrasonic testing and X-ray imaging are used to check for any defects or weaknesses in the hull. 
Then the hull is hydrostatically pressure tested. The hull is put in a pressure chamber filled with water. The pressure is slowly increased to simulate the conditions the submersible will face at its maximum operating depth. Limiting factor is tested to a pressure of 1200 atmospheres, which is 20% higher than the pressure of the deepest part of the ocean. The pressure hull passes the test without deforming or failing. It's then certified by the American Bureau of Shipping as safe for use to its intended depth. The hull then has to have regular inspections and tests to ensure it stays safe and maintains its certification. This is the type of vessel I would expect a high-end adventure tourism company to buy. The buoyancy of limiting factor is made from syntactic foam, similar to James Cameron's Deep Sea Challenger. The biggest difference between Deep Sea Challenger and limiting factor is that limiting factor is designed and engineered to make ongoing repetitive dives to these depths. It needs to be inspected and tested at regular intervals but it will remain in service. And this is where the use of metal is important. Metal is flexible. It can contract under pressure and expand as the pressure is released. Rush continues to use Cyclops 1 for expeditions until Titan is ready for sea trials. In 2019, Cyclops 1 makes weekly expedition dives to Possession Sound, five miles southwest of Port Everett Marina, where Ocean Gate has its headquarters. This is the final series of expedition dives where Cyclops 1 is on center stage but it also marks a first. OceanGate regularly has citizen scientists engage in their research dives, but this series of dives marks the introduction of mission specialists. The dives range in depth from 115 meters to 150 meters. These dives are in US waters, which we already know has a depth limit of 45 meters for tourist dives. It's not clear to me if these are paying clients, but I feel like Rush is starting to test the limits of the law to see where it pushes back. Between 0800 and 0945 on the 18th of June, the Titan and Polar Prince exchange communication every 15 minutes. Text messages are sent back and forth to confirm depth, check systems are functioning, and that the crew are well. Communication in the limiting factor and James Cameron's Deep Sea Challenger use acoustic modems that send signals through the water. This is the same type of system used in the Titan. Communication underwater is notoriously difficult and submersibles expect to lose communication from time to time. An underwater modem takes a piece of data and converts it into a data package to transmit. That data package is decoded by another modem. Because this equipment loses signal from time to time, Acoustic modems are designed to enter a sync and search mode when they lose contact. It's expected to happen. The further apart the two modems are, the harder it becomes to maintain contact. A set of procedures is put in place in case the signal is lost. The Polar Prince support vessel should wait until the expected time for the Titan to return to the surface before raising the alarm. In 2018, David Lockridge inspects the Titan submersible when it's handed over from engineering to operations. Rush has tasked him with the inspection to ensure the safety of the crew during dives. Lockridge is an experienced marine engineer and submersible pilot with a background in submarine operations and rescue techniques with the Royal Navy. So he has the knowledge and experience to identify potential problems. After the inspection, Lockridge sends his report which details a number of concerns and arrives at the conclusion that he cannot sign off the vessel. In particular, he points out that both non-destructive tests like x-rays or ultrasound and a destructive hydrostatic pressure test have not been done. Rush has either opted not to pay for these kinds of tests or decided not to do them. The Titan pressure hull is not tested for strength or durability. He's also concerned that Rush has decided to plan manned dives without these tests. The final nail in Lockridge's coffin is when he disagrees with the company's decision to use a porthole window that's only rated to 1300 meters or 130 atmospheres. The intended dive depth for the Titan is more than twice that at 400 atmospheres of pressure. Lockridge is fired and sued by OceanGate for exposing trade secrets. Lockridge countersues and the case is settled out of court. Of course, we know that Rush has stated that he doesn't want to hire 50 year olds with gray hair. He would prefer to hire 25 year olds who are more inspirational or perhaps less likely to raise concerns. 
Through the course of 2018, OceanGate performs a series of test dives with Stockton Rush at the helm of the Titan submersible, descending to increasing depths. On the 10th of December 2018, Rush descends to 4,000 meters. He pauses several times as he descends to check the integrity of the hull and make sure the hull monitoring system is working. After seven hours, he returns to the surface as the second person in history to make a solo dive to 400 atmospheres. OceanGate declare this as their validation dive. When you design an aircraft, you can do all the testing, modeling, and wind tunnel experiments you want. But at a certain point, the only way you can confirm that your design flies is to take off and fly. I can see Rush bringing the same philosophy to this project. Rush gives a talk at GeekWire to share his successful dive and his ambitions. During this talk, he focuses on what the broader tech audience might like to hear. But he also reveals some other parts of his thinking. This slide shows that he's keenly aware of the potential for more oil and gas, rare earth minerals and metals than land has to offer. And the language that OceanGate uses on their website aligns with these principles with safe, low impact to the environment, quality and cost-efficient solutions, our goal is to deliver crude submersible programs that allow our clients to make better connections and inform decisions related to their deep water missions. During the course of 2021 and 22, OceanGate makes four expeditions to the Titanic, logging a total of 13 dives. It's incredible to think that the submersible they designed and built using innovative technologies borrowed from aerospace and executed with inspirational young talent actually works. The Silicon Valley philosophy of develop fast, break rules and run before you can walk delivered exactly what they set out to achieve. But much like a tech startup, the cracks start to appear long before the implosion. Successful tech startups use this philosophy to find the cracks early and iterate in order to develop a sustainable product. OceanGate ignores the cracks. It's almost as if Rush doesn't want to see the problems. He's invested so heavily in one thing being right that now it's impossible for him to backtrack. It's impossible for a diver to reach the depths of the Titanic. The deepest a diver has successfully gone is around 600 meters with almost a week of decompression. The depths of the Titanic would mean any breathing gas is compressed so much that it's approaching the density of water. That means the only way to reach the Titanic is in a submersible. Submersibles are designed to hold back the pressure of the water and protect a one atmosphere bubble of air from the surface. In order to do that, they make use of every advantage available to them. They use a sphere, which is the strongest shape with no straight lines so that the pressure is uniform across the pressure hull. They use the strongest materials available, materials that can withstand the shrinking and expanding that the pressure hull will experience as it descends and ascends. The materials are tested using X-ray and ultrasound. Then the pressure hull is hydrostatically tested in a water-filled pressure chamber to 20% greater pressure than what it will experience with its crew. At 0947, communication between Titan and Polar Prince is lost. They lose both the text message chat with the crew as well as the regular ping from the onboard systems. The crew on board the Polar Prince wait until Titan's scheduled time to resurface at 1715. They've been out of contact for nearly eight hours. At 1740, crew on the Polar Prince contact the Coast Guard to inform them that the submersible is overdue. They give the Coast Guard the location of the Titanic wreckage 900 nautical miles east of Cape Cod and inform them that there are five souls on board. Carbon fiber is a strong material, but it's also a rigid material. You can compare carbon fiber to fiberglass. The glass strands give strength to the resin and carbon fiber strands are even stronger. The problem I can see is that the resin is the part that binds these materials. Metal can withstand some flexibility because it's a single piece of metal. It's not prone to breaking apart within its own structure. Layers of carbon fiber are rigid and so as it's compressed under the extreme weight of the water, it will be prone to small fractures within the layering. 
Not because the carbon fiber is not strong enough, but because the resin is not flexible enough. This delamination can cause weakness. The sensors used to monitor the hull can only pick up what happens during one dive. It doesn't monitor the cumulative effect of multiple dives. Titan's cylinder holds almost 40,000 liters of air. At 380 atmospheres of pressure, that air should occupy a volume of 100 liters. In less than an instant, the water pressure overpowers the cumulative weakness and implodes. Unfortunately, Rush only had to fail once at that depth. The true philosophy of a tech startup is to fail multiple times along the way. I think Rush did innovate. He succeeded to reach the Titanic with a neutrally buoyant vessel that was potentially less expensive to build than its predecessors. I couldn't find a figure for the actual cost. Perhaps the future of ultra deep water submersibles does lie in carbon fiber. Perhaps a spherical shape combined with carbon fiber would mean that the layers of fiber could overlap in alternating directions. Perhaps the carbon fiber should be encapsulated inside a second titanium sphere. Maybe it just needs to be thicker. Maybe a new type of resin would work. One that's strong and flexible enough to withstand these forces in combination with a spherical shape and carbon fiber. We don't know because it hasn't been tested. People needlessly paid with their lives because the steps of testing and confirming and iteration were ignored in favor of rushing to get to the end goal. I think Rush wanted to be right with that one idea instead of finding the right solution over time. You see it all the time in businesses where the owner has an idea and works purely to prove their idea is right rather than making changes until the final product works. When John Day died in his wooden box, it wasn't the end for submersibles. Since then, submersibles have even been made from wood. I don't think the question is what went wrong. I think it's quite easy to see in hindsight what went wrong. The more important question should be what went right and how can we innovate on that in a way that builds on these successes? How can testing materials help to improve submersibles in the future? On the 19th of June, search and rescue efforts begin with spotter planes and underwater detection aids deployed across an enormous search area. News coverage defines an estimated 96 hours of oxygen available to the crew of the Titan. The Coast Guard deploys a C-130 Hercules and P-8 Poseidon aircraft with underwater searchabilities to scour the area. On the 20th of June, France deploys the Atlanta, a research and survey vessel to assist with the rescue mission. They start to detect sounds from below the surface at regular intervals. But with the number of rescue vessels arriving on the scene, this could simply be an anomaly created not by the Titan, but by the rescue itself. US Navy submersible Curve 21 joins the search with an operational depth of 4,000 meters, one of the few that can reach the depths of the Titan. The Curve 21 is a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, that is controlled via a fiber optic umbilical cable and has multiple high definition cameras and manipulators for carrying out intricate tasks. On the 21st, the Atlanta arrives on the scene and deploys an ROV called Victor 6000. It runs a 6000 meter cable from the Atlanta and is described as Titan's last hope. The 22nd of June is the deadline for Titan's oxygen capacity. Later that day, the Titan's debris field is found around 500 meters from the wreck of the Titanic. The US Navy then revealed they heard what they would describe as the sound of an implosion. I imagine they waited until they had confirmation before disclosing that information. If they disclosed that earlier, it would have added to the media frenzy and the search would continue regardless. It's almost impossible to identify location from sound underwater, so there's no advantage to the rescue mission in disclosing that information. By not disclosing what they heard, if the sub had been found intact, they would have been wrong. In my mind, revealing that information earlier would have added nothing but fuel for the media. It's purely a distraction. One thing is absolutely clear in my mind. The race to mine the ocean floors is on. Odyssey Marine scrapped their treasure finding business model to mine the oceans. Oil exploration and mining at the seabed will drive innovation. Out there right now, millions of people are thinking this accident will deter others from making the same mistake. But in reality, someone is inspired by what Rush accomplished. They'll see the opportunity to explore the depths of the ocean and innovate on OceanGate's design. I can see a clear correlation between this disaster and the race to mine the ocean floor.
The question we should be asking ourselves is, what disasters will that mining bring? Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring the math, science and engineering in this video. You can use the link below to sign up for a free trial.